start off, um, first of all, are there any questions? Okay, this is CSE 519. Um, are there any questions um, about how many people have started homework, uh, the homework uh, for the course? Seeing a little bit of nodding. More cameras I can see, the better, because I do like to see people. Um, are there any questions or uh, experiences people have had on the homework? Professor, yeah. uh, I just wanted to make a note from last class. I mentioned that the, the revenue shops were weird. I, I went back and looked over my stuff and Nikita was right. Uh, I had some errors in my code. The, it doesn't change the fact that there are shops that have like um, only a month's worth of revenue or even a day's worth, but those aren't in, featured in the top highest revenue shops. And I wanted to clear that up. Okay, fair enough. Any um, interesting things people have seen in this data that uh, they would like to talk about? I always kind of I always kind of like to hear about interesting things in data, and I'm too lazy to work on the data set myself. Um, so, is there anybody who's got um, what you call it? Anything anything interesting that people have seen so far? Okay, any other questions about the homework before I go any further? Okay, the homework's due. Oh, oh, I'm yes. sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, okay. Question, yes. Yeah, when in the instruction you mentioned to convert our Python code to three format, and I was wondering if there is a good way other than copy and paste. Okay, so what did we want to do? The claim is that you are building your code in a um, notebook, which is a computable object, which is a good thing. Um, now, uh, we also wanted you to, to convert that to a PDF file, which is easier to read, okay, as a document. And that should be a straightforward, um, how, do you, how do you convert uh, the notebook to a PDF? Does anybody? know how well, you, can, you export can export it, it. On your export there'll be if you have, presumably when you, uh, 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 on some button up top there's going to be an export command that will tell you how to deal with that now we also would like the code separate so conceivably we could do things like check for uh, similarity and things like that that's why we also wanted a dot pi file am i correct how do we get it what's the most efficient way to get a dot pi file it's also an export option. Okay. I think it's like file export. Uh, okay. File file export. Yeah. So the claim is it's file export. Somebody, um, what you call it, uh, post this on the uh, on Piazza, and that'll make that straightforward. Any other questions about the homework or experiences people have had that they want to talk about? Uh, a follow up back. I do things a little different. I write code in a Py file and I'm trying to find a way to convert it into a notebook format and a PDF. So does oh. anyone have this kind yeah. of- Yeah, speaking from experience in that regard, you're just gonna have to copy it piece by piece into the notebook. There's really no good conversion. Well, there, there should be no reason why you're writing a separate Python code. You should be building a, uh, what you call it, a, a notebook and playing around with it, okay? So I encourage you to build this thing. You should be building this within a notebook. A notebook is a great thing. You get to see, you know, you know see, see, see the results of running it. You get to modify something and update the whole pipeline, okay? So, um, so the, the comment we had was going from notebook to Python. Any questions? Any other questions about the homework? Going once, going twice. Okay. Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I have a question on, on homework because uh, we have many discretized var variables in our data set. 
So that means it's impossible to use binary, uh, binary hot coding or one hot coding in coding. So is there any other way to Okay, what I think what you're telling me is you're trying to build a data set. You're saying that many of the variables are categorical variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's an example of a categorical variable in the data set? For example, the uh, number of the shop, the uh, different um, shop IDs, item IDs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like Even the ID number of a shop is what I'm hearing. Is that yeah, what you yeah. mean? Yeah, and the different, uh, let me think of uh, different merchant, uh, different items, yeah, different items. Okay, and different items, okay? Yeah. So um, what you're saying is if you try to make a, a uh, data set to turn it into a new data set where for each categorical variable, you, if there's, let's say, 206 shops, you could turn that one categorical variable into 206 um, columns with a one if, if it's that shop and everything else be zero. Now yeah, this yeah. you're noticing creates a huge number of variables and it's hard to keep track of what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, again, there's this area of feature engineering. How do you try to find uh, meaningful things? Well, one question might be that maybe the individual shop is not an interesting um, numerical variable for a linear regression, okay? Maybe big shops versus little shops is a, is a meaningful variable, okay? So for example, again, you say that there's 206 shops. What is it that makes the shops different? Okay. I can imagine maybe size. Okay. I can imagine maybe, I was told some of these were in, are, are they all in, in the same country or are some of them different kinds of shops? It might be that what you want are instead to group the shops by properties and have that, those properties be what are the variables that you care about. Does that I kind see. of make sense? I see, I see. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I know. And that for the variables, you know, you may not want uh, uh, each um, particular item to be a uh, thing, but on the other hand, there's probably items that are big and items that are small, okay? There's items that are expensive and items that are cheap, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's probably more meaningful aggregations that you can find given to what you know about stores. And that would be my, my preferred way to do it rather than just blow everything up into a matrix and hope that you're going to, uh, your regression is going to magically find something. I see, I see. Okay, Thank but you. I encourage you to play around with it. This is why, we, why we're doing this exercise. There's different ways you might do that. And yeah. again, I encourage you to... My first recommendation, as I said, was keep it simple, the KISS thing. If you have a feature that is very, very difficult to figure out how to use, what should you do with it? Probably at first ignore it, okay? And see what you can do without it, okay? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. So I encourage you to, you know, there's some judgment here of going where what is a path that you think is the easiest path and the uh, most likely to be fruitful, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that, especially at the beginning, is what I would be trying to do, okay? I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions about it? Um, I had one question. Okay, go um, Many of the tasks, uh, it seems to me that uh, kind of are open to interpretation. I mean, there can be multiple interpretations and um, is it okay if I think my interpretation is reasonable and I'm coding like that and something like that? Okay, it, deliberately, I make this so that it is relatively open-ended, okay? And um, this is good because it gives you a chance to explore and use your judgment. It is perhaps bad if you are obsessed about a grade and oh my God, are they gonna mark it right, okay? I am gonna say, you know, 
we will do what you think is is appropriate and if we heartily disagree we will take off and if but but hopefully you're 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 trying to do something that's sensible with that so i encourage you to to, to think about what the problem says use your interpretation and go through it Typically, what I will tell the TAs to do, just so you know, when there's something where there's a lot of interpretation, I will tell the, the, the TAs to throw the, the problems into buckets, the solutions. Was this an unusually good, interesting answer? Was this an unusually bad answer? Was this an unusually normal answer? <clears throat> now there's three different buckets, and I might have them assign the grade for the problem based on uh, which bucket you fell in. Okay, so yes, th this is open for interpretation, um, but I want you to try to explore. That's part of what makes this, I, I, I think that's fundamental here, that you gotta be, start to think about what are reasonable things to do, okay, and try to explore and do it. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, I think I see a hand up, Ethan. Going once. Any questions? Uh, professor, um, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, professor, the event, so uh, in the test, in the end, we just have to predict the uh, given an item and then how much monthly uh, sell it's gonna have, like the monthly value it have. So uh, I just wonder like, what is some, of, and I do look over data, I just realized some item doesn't even sell in a particular month or in many months or until later of the year. So, so uh, if you're asked to predict like what's the, like the, what was the item gonna sell in a month? Uh, how, how you can, like okay, what's the- What you're trying to say, I think is, what if an item has never sold before? How much will it sell? What would you predict for it'll sell for the next month? Okay. I You're think... right that you have very little information about this, okay? Um, and, um, you know, you would expect that these would be hard problems to try to answer, okay? So I would imagine, you know, if you think about it, um, this is one reason why people who make Hollywood movies have trouble. Because, of course, every movie is... Um, what you call it, a unique movie. The movie was never made before. And yet they've got to predict how much they're gonna sell when they start to make the movie, okay? That's one reason why these people have insecure lives, okay? Um, what's a reasonable model? If you're asking me, um, a, a good estimate of how much an item that has never sold before will sell. A good first model would be to say zero, okay? But this is gonna get a little bit into the question of discounting. Later on in the semester, we'll talk about a statistical method called discounting, which is how do you estimate the probability of something that you haven't seen before, okay? Um, and uh, there, there are ways to estimate the probability of something you've never seen before, okay? If you're curious, look in my book under Ed One Discounting. But here it's a little bit different. Um, it's uh, the problem you're saying is about an item that's never sold before. You're not really interested in the probability. You're kind of interested in an expected value or a forecast. And my instinct would be to start with zero unless you know something about the object. Maybe a more sophisticated model would be to say, what items is this like, okay, in my data before, and how did they sell in their first month? That might be an alternate model for how you do it, okay? Okay. Okay, so play around and think about it. Any other questions? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, let me just try this. My screen is now, I may be in trouble here. No, back. Okay, hold on a second. 
Okay, you guys are seeing my, uh, okay, my screen's moving. Any last questions before I start the lecture? Okay, sorry for the delay. Today I'd like to talk about data cleaning, which is a um, very important, um, you know, factor in trying to make sense of a model. Typically, you guys will have some kind of, it, it's easy to get some kind of a data set, or, or on a problem you care about, there's usually some kind of data set you can find related to it. Um, but there is a fair amount of pre-processing that um, you have to uh, often do to make full sense of a data set. And a lot of the problems that I have found in practice when I work with students or when I work on a research project is when people make problems um, at really an early dumb level of dealing with the data set. Okay, in some sense, we're, we're computer scientists, we're data scientists, we want to work on the latest algorithm and we want to get everything right. Okay, often the biggest problems come very, very early. And, um, you know, if you, you're trying to do an analysis of a data set that uh, has no, uh, you know, that, what you call it, that you don't really know what it means, okay, that there's, that there's inconsistencies in it, that can mess everything up. And so what I'd like to talk today is about uh, different ways of cleaning. These cleaning in my mind includes a couple of things. It means unifying different data sets and removing inconsistencies. It remains dealing with missing values, okay, or, or zero counts, okay. That's actually kind of one, one of the problems that was just being discussed. How do I deal with something that's never been sold before? It means identifying outliers that may be a problem and properly dealing with them, okay? And these I find, um, if you don't get this stuff right, everything else is, is meaningless in your analysis. Any questions about it? That's the phrase, garbage in, garbage out. And I'd like to motivate um, the study of data cleaning by a particular project I worked on with uh, you know, with some students and, and another and faculty member, um, which had to do with analyzing PubMed data. We wanted to know something about, we were trying to learn how to predict who was going to be a great scientist from an early part of their record, okay? So you could imagine a world where, um, you know, what, 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 what do researchers do? They write papers, okay? And maybe their papers get cited, Okay, by other papers. I'm the faculty recruiting chair of our department. My job is to try to hire good fat people who will be young people who will be good faculty members and go on to have great careers. Wouldn't it be great if I could look at the, the people's publication record and figure out who's going to be good and who's going to not, you know, who's going to be a, a star and who's, who's, who's not? Okay, so we wanted to try to look at this. And one thing, PubMed is a data of all publications in the, in the um, life sciences, essentially. And we wanted to try to identify for each of the 100,000 most frequently cited authors, what was the year of their publication, their first publication, okay? So everybody, uh, every uh, researcher has a year of first publication. For me, it was in grad school. It was probably about 1984 or 1985, okay? For the younger faculty in our department, it might have been 2011, it might have been 2014, who knows? Does everybody agree that every author has a um, first year of publication, okay? And does everybody agree that if we have 100,000 most frequently cited authors, we should expect to have a distribution. Let me see if I can draw this. Yes, boom, boom, uh-oh. Sorry about, about this. This is, uh, my pad is behaving in ways I am not pleased with. Okay, let me try this. Okay, you guys see this, right? So we have a, um, what I claim is that we have a, a world where we can have a graph where the x-axis is the year. And I'm sorry about this, this is, 
I am unhappy now. The y x axis is the year. The y axis is the number of authors. And my writing is not filling in very fast. I don't know quite what disease my, my iPad has. But does everybody see what's going on? I want a graph where the um, x-axis is the year, the y-axis is the number of authors who had their first, of top authors who had their first publication year, that year. Okay? What should this distribution look like? Can anybody make me a proposal? of what this distribution should look like. Okay? Uniform. Uniform. So you're saying that the top 100,000 authors, it should look uniform, something like that. The number of authors born every, top 100,000 authors born by total citations, they should have been born uniformly by year. Does anybody uh, uh, disagree with that or agree with that? I think it'll be skewed. You think it's skewed? Why is it going to be skewed? I think that the authors that are older will have had time to accumulate more citations. Right. Look at me. I've got 19,000 citations. Is that because I'm good or is that because I'm old? If I was a young person, if all my papers were written last year, no one's had time to read them. Right? So maybe you're expecting, if that's the argument, Maybe you think that something like that would be the distribution. Okay? Older authors would, you know, would be more likely to um, have a lot of citations than younger ones. Any questions about that? Any other ideas? I do think, by the way, when you're dealing with data, it's good to think about what the distribution should be before you actually look and see what it is. So I then asked a student to produce this distribution from the PubMed data, and they got the following plot, okay? So the x-axis was the number, is the year of uh, first publication. The y-axis is the, um, what you call it, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the y-axis is the, uh, um, you know, number of authors with that. Any questions about this? Does people think that this looks right? Or is there important. a problem? This I think the spike in the 2000s is because of the internet boom. Like, people started you think to that publish what? more. You think that, that, that the, the, the spike around 2000, 2100 was because the internet was invented, okay? And that suddenly when the internet happened, suddenly everybody that came out, graduated that year from grad school became a great scientist. Okay? A great scientist, but when it started publishing more papers. Maybe they published more papers, that's your theory, okay? Any other theories about this? Uh, duplicate its records. What, I couldn't hear that. Uh, duplicate it inside the data sets. So maybe what you're concerned with is that if the data, if, if the data that they had, which was um, all the papers that were published in a year, if for some reason he had, a, he had a duplicate of more papers from 2000, starting 2001, okay, maybe he treated, treated that process file twice, maybe that would explain it, okay? Mm -hmm. I would say I would say their data is biased. Maybe they have a data about seventies and have a data set about twenties and two thousand and they compare two data set and they don't have much data about nineties. Okay, so one possibility is they had incomplete data that they only had data from one from one side and data from another side. Okay. In fact, this was complete data, okay? That wasn't what caused it. What is it that, uh, that ultimately caused the problem? Okay, and I'm hoping, again, my, my pad is not as responsive as I like it to be for some reason. Okay, one thing that happened when you looked at PubMed, when they looked deeper at it, 
was that uh, the authors, in the olden days, p authors were listed in their citations by their first initials. Starting in 2002, okay, they started listing authors by first name, okay? So now all the papers by Skeena, I was SS Skeena up until 2002, and then I became Stephen Skeena. Does everybody agree that if you aggregate this in, 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 in a certain way, it looks like SS Skeena is a different person than Stephen Skeena, okay? And the, 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 that was the source of the problem, that the names didn't mean the same thing all through the record, okay? And um, you know, again, I was working with this, this I'll admit, student, graduate student in physics, and they were coming up with all kinds of theories. No, the data was right. It was because the government started funding more science. It was a lot of things are, that you see in data sets are artifacts of how you process it. For some reason, I thought I had a slide about artifact. There's a difference kind of between an error and an artifact in my world. An artifact is a computational thing that you do to your data, which means it can be fixed. An error is um, kind of something that is, you know, inherent in your data and there's nothing you could do about it. A lot of problems in data analysis come from your pro analysis introducing artifacts that aren't there, okay? And cleaning is to, do, to kind of remove these things. Now let's look at this distribution and decide if we like this distribution. Why is it that it looks like all the so more great scientists were, were um, found, you know, emerged in uh, 1966 or so, 1965, I guess, than any other period? Is that a problem? Can anyone imagine why that is? Could it be the advancement of technologies commonly used in the fields that are being published on? It could be advancement of technology. It turns out one of the technologies was building the PubMed database. The PubMed database didn't include any essentially any papers before the 1960, okay? And even then it, it, it didn't really get to be comprehensive till about 1965. So what is the situation? It is the case that um, the, 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 the initial tale here was that there were very few, um, what you call it, uh, journals where um, they were monitoring. Then around 1965 is when they started getting a lot of papers. So all active scientists from that period first came into being around here, okay? And then, um, you know, once that's been done, the year of first birth was pretty steady state, okay? And why then did it deteriorate at the end? This is the older, younger factor that you guys were talking about, that if you were born and had your first paper in 2010, you've got to be pretty unbelievable in a small number of years to rank among the top 100,000 scientists ever. Okay, and that's so. So this is now the right distribution. Any questions? So the the moral here is I want you guys to be looking at your data for what th think what the distribution should be, and um, then um, what you call it, and then uh, you know, you know, basically if it doesn't smell the way it should, you guys have to think about that. Any questions about this? Okay, so again, I, you know, an amazing number of projects I've worked on, with results looked interesting and weird and exciting up until the moment we realized that they didn't make any sense because of a fundamental problem early in the process. And that's why this is kind of important. Okay, so let's talk about um, one aspect of data cleaning is what I'm gonna say is, uh, compatibility. There is this question about making sure that you're making, I want to say, apples to apples comparisons in your data set. 
What was the problem on my that PubMed example? Uh, the problem was that I wasn't comparing names from 1965 in a way that made sense with data from 1990-95. Okay, and um, often you need to unify your data set in order to make that uh, happen. So I'm going to talk here uh, for, for the rest of the day about a bunch of these kind of unification things. Okay, and um, that you need to be looking out for when you're dealing with um, data sets. Okay, the first category has to deal with what I will say unit conversions. Okay, if one of your categories is, um, you know, let's say the weight of an object, the weight of an object, okay, if some, sometimes the entries are given in kilograms and sometimes it's given in pounds, you have a problem, okay? The field doesn't mean anything. If you unify data sets, often you build a data set by taking a couple of different data sets. You have to make sure that the, um, what you call it, the, the, the units are all correct, okay? And, um, you know, this requires looking at your data pretty carefully to make sure that this happens. Bad things happen when you do, um, you know, not convert properly between, um, you know, if your met metric and uh, non-metric data. Um, NASA had a rocket blow up, okay? And uh, when they later figured out what was the cause of this rocket blowing up, it turned out somewhere in the code somebody had converted between a metric number and an English number. Okay, English meaning inches, foot, pound. Okay, in an incorrect way. And that was, that was ultimately the reason the rocket blew up. And so you can imagine the programmer was embarrassed, okay, afterwards, okay, because this was a big deal. Um, so how can you um, kind of solve these problems when you're building a data set or a unifying data set? to make sure your units are right. One of them, of course, is to stick to the metric system because the metric system is less weird than um, the uh, you know, English system. But um, even if you stick to the metric system, if you're measuring a height, a distance, are you measuring it in uh, meters, kilometers, or centimeters? Okay, this can be a problem, okay? How can you tell whether a data set might have um, units that are, um, let's say you have measurements of height. Let's say I take people, I merge some data sets of people from different situations. How do I know that they were measured in the same unit? Okay, or how might I be able to check that they aren't measured in the same unit? Well, you could just generate a plot that compares quantity and height. So meters, you'd expect something at about two yeah, feet, you'd expect something around five Right, does everybody agree that if I took a look at if this was height, if this was the frequency, and this was the height, okay, I would expect that if it was properly done and it was in meters, I think people are two meters tall, is my understanding, or, or ballpark of something like that. You would expect that if it was a, all in meters, the data set would look like this. What if it was a data set in feet? What would it look like? It'd be the same thing centered around six. And if you, um, what you call it, if you have a bimodal distribution here, that probably indicates trouble. Does everybody kind of agree? So looking at this, the, the, the pl residual plots of each variable and making sure that it makes sense, this would be a useful thing. Any questions? Actually, if I had a data of human height, would I expect it to be unimodal or bimodal? Bimodal means that there's two peaks. Unimodal means there's one peak. Would I expect it to be unimodal or bimodal? There should be two nearby modes because men and women are centered around different values. Men and women are generally, you know, there, there's a different, different average height for men and women, right? Actually, it probably looks something like this. I'm going to guess something boop boop. 
okay? But again, understanding, looking at it, seeing if you have an explanation that makes sense, this is a useful thing. Any for questions? The, for the unit, um, for the one where you're looking at the two, the bimodal distribution to see if there's different units, you'd expect the larger one to have a proportionally larger standard deviation, right? Okay, so um, one, okay, so again, I'm, I'm not sure I completely heard what you were saying. I mean, one thing, of course, is that you should, before you merge the data sets, look to see what unit they're in. That's obviously a good idea. Um, and, um, you know, again, we would expect that, uh, you know, you're, you're claiming by studying the spread of the units, the, the, the standard deviation, as well as the mean, the, the, the peak, that will probably tell you something. I agree with you, it, it, you know, it's informative. You gotta look at it. Like if a, if a meter is 100 times larger than a centimeter, then I would expect the standard deviation to be 100 times smaller. I see, what you're saying is that if I had a, a uh, peak of, um, if I had a mix of people measured in meters or centimeters, I would expect that the centimeters one would have a lot of spread. Okay, actually, did, 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 did you get my drawing in now? Boom, I think I did that again. The meters one you're saying would be a much tighter distribution on this plot, right? That would be another sign that if you had these two wild peaks that they were from different distributions. Any questions? There's one other way. What if you were determined if you had height fields and you didn't know whether it was meters or uh, you, you had two data sets you wanted to merge and you had height fields and you had no idea what they, unit they were measuring it in? Is there any way you could, you could integrate that data? One way might be to take e each field in each data set and convert it to something called a z-score. We will talk about that a little bit more, but what's a z-score? The z-score of a value x is equal to um, x minus the mean of x. Is this going to work? Or Again, I'm unhappy with my technology today. Um, divided by um, what you call it, sigma. So, um, the z-score of a value of x, like let's say a particular height of a person, would be x minus the mean of that column in that data set, divided by the standard deviation in that data set. This now would convert that quantity to a positive number if the value was greater than the mean, a negative number if it was lower than the mean, and it would normalize it based on how much variance there is in, among the numbers. This way that if I knew that in all of these files, they were measured in British rods, let's say they were measured, the height was measured, measured in British rods, and in another they were measured in micrometers, we would expect the distribution of z-scores of these to be the same, okay? And those, those could then be merged in a certain way. Any questions about that? Bottom line is you got to be careful when you before you do one of these merging projects. Any questions? Good. Another problem that uh, happens a lot is that uh, when you are converting between numbers, numbers in computers come in different types. There are floating point numbers. There are, um, you know, 32-bit integers. There are 16-bit integers. There are 64-bit integers, okay? There are fractions, okay? If you try to convert a number in one numerical representation to the other one badly, you will get bad results. There was another rocket. This one was French, I believe, that blew up, okay? And the reason when they looked at the software Turned out that they had tried to convert a 64-bit floating point number to a 16-bit integer, and they did it in a bad way, and so the rocket blew up, 
Okay, so these are, uh, you know, these are subtle problems, but kind of important. How would I deal with n numbers? Well, first of all, recognize that the easiest numbers to work with tend to be decimal numbers, okay, floating point numbers. And when you're measuring something, I usually expect a floating point number from it. Um, if I have a field that's going to tell me a count, a count should be an integer. Sometimes I see spreadsheets where you'll tell me that there's, you know, um, in this particular, that, that in your sales data, you sold 96.0 um, units that month. Thinking of it as a real number is a dangerous thing. These things you should recognize have to be integers. Occasionally, you get um, data sets where you get numbers represented in fractional quantities. And if you have a fraction, you're much better off storing it not as a numerator as a and a denominator, but as a decimal, okay? Um, I had uh, a data set on one of the uh, Quantrop videos where they represented baby weights as the number of integer pounds was one field that, that the baby weighed, and then the number of remaining ounces as a second field. This was crazy, okay? The right thing to do should have been to measure the um, baby weight in one field as ounces or kilograms or whatever it is, okay? But you get in, if you represent somebody's height as a, their feet and another value is inches, that is a sign of trouble. Any questions? Okay, and the way you find these troubles, you have to look at your data and make sure you know what it means. Any questions? A particularly nasty uh, issue with cleaning data that, um, that people have has to do with character code representations happens in my lab, we have an issue of this right now, okay? There are, you know, in the olden days, when I was growing up, the whole world, when you wanted to represent characters, okay, there was a single byte coding system called ASTI, okay, that represented every character as a seven-bit code. But that was the day when we didn't deal with foreign languages. We didn't deal with uh, many things, okay? Um, now there is, um, what you call it? There are, are a bunch of different character um, codes, okay? There is most important this thing called Unicode, which is a standard for representing all the character scripts of all the languages on earth, okay? And it is a very complicated thing. There is a, uh, to do it right, there is an encoding called UTF-8, okay, that enables you to code for all these characters using a complicated multi-byte scheme, okay? Um, now, there are other codes. The modern version of ASTI, is something called ISO, I sometimes hear it ISO Latin, or this is apparently the coding number. This is a 200, an 8-bit code that encodes for all the language symbols that are, um, what you call it, commonly used in European languages. Bottom line is, if you have text and you don't encode it right, what you end up getting are junk. Has any, anybody ever gone to a web page? and seen something that looked like this, okay, where you see some character strings there, and then the rest of them are replaced by question marks, or uh, blanks, or something like that. That is often the case because the web assumes a certain encoding of the text, okay, and somebody cut and pasted a code from text that was encoded in something else, put it into, um, the, 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 the web page, and now it isn't properly understood. So recognize that um, if you're dealing with text data, getting the coding right, knowing what the encoding is from the original source, knowing what your library is expecting are critical things, and if not, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Any questions about that?
One problem I have, just as a, an example of where these things come in, is that uh, I often will try to cut something out of a web page, you know, and stick it in some kind of a document I'm writing. And I will then edit it and, you know, massage it and do my, my, my thing. One thing that I always have trouble with is there seem to be different encodings of punctuation. And that somehow what I think of as being a dash, okay, is somehow encoded differently in certain character sets. And this, this tends not to work. So recognize if you're dealing with character codings, you have to be very careful. You have to be vigilant about that. Any questions? How many people have hit this problem before in their lives? Trying to make use of a text data. Is there anybody else who has a sad story to tell about this? At least one person. Okay. And uh, this is one you got to be aware. Any questions? With Python, you don't really need to worry about that, right? In what? With Python, you don't really need to worry about that, right? Because like it would just handle the encoding for you? Okay, the answer to that, I assume, is no, okay? Or without knowing, but if you're assuming some magic thing is gonna handle it, you are setting yourself up for trouble, okay? You've gotta be aware that there are multiple encoding systems. And if you take data from one source and magically read it in Python, there is no way it, it can automatically know what, what encoding it is, okay? So I don't believe that that's generally true, okay? I don't believe that if you, you know, you took that Russian text that we had, magically put that, read that into Python, it would necessarily read it properly as Russian, okay? So I think that's something you've got to be careful about. Any questions? Another problem that was one of the things that appeared in the uh, cautionary tale I had in there has to do with unifying names. Names are a common field in data. And um, many times there are inconsistencies on, on names. Uh, I, am, I appear on the web, sometimes I am Stephen Skeena, sometimes I'm Steve, sometimes I'm S. Sometimes they use my middle name or my middle initial. Sometimes they spell my name correctly. Often they spell my name incorrectly. Okay. Does everybody see that um, if you're trying to catch or, you know, deal with, let's say, names that appear in a data set, you've got to deal with spelling problems. You've got to deal with incompleteness. You've got to deal with a lot of these things. Okay. How can we unify names in a world where sometimes they are given as, um, you know, uh, you know, uppercase or lowercase, okay? You know, typically, um, you know, this is a messy thing to do, okay? One thing that, that, that is a common technique is to use some kind of simple transformation, like convert everything to lowercase, remove the middle name, okay? What happens if you remove the middle name? Are you likely to get more matches between, you know, you know, references to, to, to people? Yeah. The answer is yes. Are those matches necessarily going to always be the, be identical, be the right person? No. No, you might create Frankenstein people, Franken people, who are kind of cut from the body parts of a lot of different people, right? If you merge two identities, you, you know, so there's kind of this trade-off that you have between if you don't try to unify things, okay, you will end up with many, many different references to people. You'll think that Stephen Skiena, okay, is a real person, okay, if you don't do the unification. On the other hand, if you merge everybody together, you may think that every... John Smith is the same person, okay? And so these are, these, you know, you have to decide kind of when you're doing this, whether you're more worried about false positives or false negatives. And this depends on your application. You should recognize that this is a sticky and messy problem. Any questions? One technique that is, I, is surprisingly cool is, um, 
there are phonetic hashing methods that try to deal with the problem we have here of misspellings. What you would like to be able to do is to take every name and find a way to hash the names together so that common misspellings all get hashed into the same bucket. And something called Soundex or Metaphone, okay, are these schemes that take a name rewrite it as a hash code with the property that common misspellings likely hash to the same thing. So for example, they will delete doubled letters. And if you delete doubled letters from Skina, Skiana, you're gonna get, um, the, uh, my, uh, Skiana is gonna match Skina, okay? So if you have to do name matching, consider using these kind of ha uh, hashing methods. Any questions about it? The interesting thing is this first one called Soundex actually dates back to the 1920s. They were worried when they were dealing with punched cards, you know, did they type in the names properly and things like that. Any questions? So unifying names is a big problem. What else is there? Again, I'm sorry I'm having some technical delays here. I'm not sure I know why. Hold on. Okay. Boom, let me come back. I just skipped one. Another problem has to do with dealing with financial data. Okay. Quite often your data, in fact, in your problem, there's clearly things there that relate to money. Is that correct? When you're dealing with money, there are often a lot of issues in trying to unify data sets or clean them up. One thing is that money, um, there are different currencies, and often you're tempted to try to col uh, collapse data from um, prices in different currencies, okay? And so in this case, you've got to worry about, um, you know, the exchange rate. There is typically an exchange rate between, as I'm sure you know, the exchange rate between um, what you call it, uh, two given currencies. When you're dealing with stock prices, sometimes there are financial events like a stock split. Okay, I think, which company recently had a stock split? I don't know if you guys follow it. You guys, any of you follow Tesla? You know, the, those people? They just had a stock split. What does that mean? The price of Tesla's stock had been going up, 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 up. Okay, everyone wanted to buy stock from Tesla. Each share got pretty expensive. I don't know if it was $1,000 a share or something like that. And so that meant that you needed $1,000 to buy one share. So every once in a while, they will do a stock split where they'll say, let's, take the price as of this given day every share is now going to get split into two shares and of course the stock company didn't get any more valuable in doing that so each share got is was really worth half as much what happened to the stock price of tesla when they did the stock split next day it should have gone down by a factor of a half or um, what am I doing here? Boom, that's what should have happened. So if you saw this, if you looked at just the stock price of Tesla, it probably would look something like this. And that did not represent a change in the value of the company. It represented a, a, a change in the number of shares. And so, um, you know, there is an, a, an art when you're dealing with financial data to dealing with um, what you call it, splits. It's also true that stocks give dividends, which means that they will pay a certain amount to the owner of a share on a given date. Like let's say a company agrees that on the 30th of September, they're gonna pay every shareholder $3. 
Well, if you own the stock on September 30th, if you, if you look at the price of the stock on September 30th, it may be worth $100. On October 1st, it should be worth $97 because you know you would have gotten those $3 of dividend if you held it on one day. And then that money has been given away, the stock is worth $3 less. Correcting properly for these things is important if you were going to be doing any meaningful analysis of what the values of companies were. Any questions about that? Stock splits, dividends, see why that changes it. Another thing when you're dealing with stocks and financial things is you probably should be thinking in terms of percentage changes of things rather than absolute changes in things. For example, suppose, um, what you call it, um, you a, a share of Tesla had been uh, $1,000 and it went up by $50. And you had another stock that was worth a hundred a hundred dollars a share, and suddenly it went up to a hundred and five dollars. Okay, I just crashed, right? Okay, that may be why I was slow. Let me go. Yeah, back. you crashed. Good. Maybe that's why I was having trouble. Let me see if I can go back. Ah, maybe this is great. Oh, look at this. I think now this is great. I'm feeling good about that. Okay. Um. Does everybody see that uh, a change in Tesla's stock, if it went from $1,000 to $1,050, is the same as if I had a share, a stock that was $100 that went up to $105? Both of these were 5% increases. Okay? It's very, very easy if you think about these in terms of absolute price changes. Okay? You know, you misinterpret that, okay? In fact, this cheaper stock had every bit as good a day as Tesla did, okay? Even though this one only went up five and the other one went up 50. Unifying these things is kind of an important thing, okay? Any questions about that? The final thing is if you're dealing with a financial data set that runs over a long period of time, you need to correct for inflation on this. You know, they're like, for example, last year I had a project where I had people analyzing movie grosses. And one of the biggest grossing movies was one called Gone with the Wind, which was a, the, a, a big, you know, the big great hit of 1939. Now, of course, Right now, today, any Avengers movie is going to make a lot more money than Gone with the Wind did, but that's because dollars today are a lot less valuable than dollars were back then. When you adjust for price, you get a meaningful comparison. Okay? Any questions when you adjust for inflation? Um, yeah, how exactly do we do the inflation? So what is the case is that, that you would probably want to go to, there are financial data sets where the government will estimate what was the inflation each year, okay? These day, days, inflation is about 2% a year. There was a time in my youth where inflation was about 8 or 10% per year. There is a data set that you can go to, okay, to find out what was the annual rate of inflation and deal with the compounding appropriately, okay? So you have to go and uh, deal with that, okay? Again, someone's saying maybe there's a data set. It would not surprise me if somewhere in Python, someone has a, a, a function that purports to correct for inflation. But note that inflation differs by country to country. So if you're inflating things in, you know, in, you know, so, so these things, these things turn out to be more complicated. In one of my quant drop videos, there was a team that was very proud. They showed me that there was a correlation between stock prices and oil prices. They said, look, when oil prices go up, stock prices go up. 
And I said, that's crazy. When oil prices go up, every company that uses oil is suffering. Their, 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 their um, income is going to go down. Stock market prices shouldn't cor should correlate inversely with oil. Why did they have this observation? Well, they noticed if they looked over 30 years and they didn't correct for inflation, over a 30-year period, stocks prices went up, and over a 30-year period, oil prices went up. Okay? And that's just because of inflation. Gold prices went up. The price of dogs went up. Okay? The price of everything went up. Okay? And they didn't get a meaningful analysis because they didn't uh, adjust for inflation. Any questions about that? That I'm kind of hoping is obvious, but uh, it's important. Um, there was one other one of these. It's funny, which I've seen. All right, here's one that I skipped. Okay. Um, another area where people have uh, problems are, um, what you call it, in dealing with time series data, in trying to get um, calendar dates and um, times to unify in a sensible way. Okay. Um, has, can anybody see anything wrong with the calendar I have in the right, on the upper le right? Does that, does that look like a normal, what, does anyone think anything is weird about September 1752. Yeah. What 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 is weird? It's discontinued. Is that when England switched from the Gregorian to the Julian calendar or something like okay, that? Okay, so if you look at this thing, nine days, I think, is it nine days or twelve days is missing. Okay. Why is that missing? Well, there was a time when um England switched from the Gregorian cal the 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 um Julian calendar, which was set up by King Julius Caesar in Rome, he didn't properly account for leap days. And, um, you know, over time, seasons started shifting because they didn't properly accumulate leap days. So Pope Gregory got together and said, wait a second, we want to adjust the calendar so that think spring starts when spring should start, not the... Uh, and, um, so Pope Gregory announced that they were, he was going to delete nine days from the calendar, okay? And uh, was it, or was it 12 days? I don't remember what it was, but he del deleted, I guess, how many days did he delete? 12. 12, okay. So um, supposedly, um, what you call it? Supposedly people rioted because they thought their, their life was going to get nine days shorter because of what the Pope did. Okay, but um, but there's all kinds of problems. Have any of you ever heard of Washington's birthday as a holiday in the United States? What day was Washington born? What is Washington's birthday? And Washington was born in, I think it was 1732. It means that Washington's birthday does not fall on Washington's birthday because of this. Does everybody kind of see that? The calendar kind of changed on this, okay? And if you're going to deal with dates before the calendar conversion, this is a problem you got to deal with, okay? But there's all kinds of other calendar problems people want to deal with. One thing has to do with coordinating between time zones, okay? That uh, if you have sales data, on your sales data, um, do they, uh, what you call it, do they have the time of sale or just the date? Do they know what minute and second it was sold? Any of you who played with that data, do they have the hourly sales time? No one admits to knowing. Um, but if the one thing I'd be curious about is, do they unify it by time zone? Okay, um, you know, in principle, you should be using a what they call UTC, which is a coordinated universal time. It used to be that the universal time standard was something called Greenwich Mean Time. Okay, um, and uh, 
anyway, U, UTC is now the time the st time standard. It's you better take your data and align it properly to the right time zone if you're going to make sense of that. Any questions about that? And even if you've got everything on UTC, there's still t problems dealing with time series. For example, suppose let's say you wanted to do a correlation between stock prices and temperatures. Okay? Maybe when it's a lousy day, people don't buy stocks as well. Okay? They, they get depressed and, and pay less for stocks or something like that. How would you know? Well, one problem to note is that uh, financial markets tend to be closed on weekends. They tend to be closed on holidays. So if you think of, let's say, sales prices as being uniformly spaced in time, the answer is no. There are gaps because things close, okay? And when you look at trying to correlate the temperature with um, the price of stocks tomorrow, should you be averaging the temperature over the entire weekend or only the day before, okay? Thinking about these kind of things are, 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 you know, necessary to do meaningful analysis of time series data. Any questions? Okay, good. Oh, okay. Okay, the other area of um, data cleaning that I think is very important is dealing with missing data. And, um, Often data is missing for a, um, a good reason, okay? Um, like for example, we did a, an analysis of Wikipedia data and we wanted to analyze all the people that who appear in Wikipedia and everybody has a name, they have a year they were born, they have a year when they died. What, if, what is the year that, of so, that somebody died if they're still alive? That is an example of missing data for a reason, okay? Sometimes data is missing because they couldn't actually record it. Really, the value kind of makes sense, okay? Um, so, you know, trying to deal with, um, you know, data that isn't there, like, for example, a missing value of what is the, uh, the, 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 the death year of people, okay, who are living. Um, uh, sometimes there's things that are left that, that have an outlier value or a um, field that's just kind of left blank because of ignorance. And sometimes you have things that are uh, events that are kind of too rare to see. Okay, that's another kind of problem. Okay, if you want to try to predict what the chances are that uh, an asteroid is going to come around and destroy civilization tomorrow. What, what, what is the probability that the world will be destroyed by an asteroid tomorrow, okay? It hopefully isn't very high, but it isn't zero. But on the other hand, none of us have seen an asteroid destroy the world so far, right? So properly dealing with rare events, setting these things to zero is often kind of the wrong thing. Does everybody kind of see that? Certainly if you set the year of death for someone in Wikipedia to be zero. That would be a bad idea, right? Because everybody would have died at the time of Christ, right? Stephen Skeena would have been born in 1961 and died in year zero, right? What would be a good estimate for the year that somebody, that somebody is gonna die in Wikipedia? If you wanna turn the year, predict the year, fill in the year of death, what would be a, a way of doing that? You could use an actuarial table, I guess, if you wanted to be. So an actuarial table, okay, thinking about, well, let's think about it. So that we get into this problem of trying to, you know, impute missing values, okay? Suppose, let's say you have a column of data and you want to figure out what, you know, have some values that are missing, okay? How would you, what would be a good number to put in there, okay? 
often it's better to estimate it or impute is kind of a fancy term for estimate or predict it, okay, instead of leaving it blank. For the age, of, for, in our case, when we were analyzing what year did somebody die, we filled it as what their birth year was plus 80, okay? And that gave us a somewhat sensible thing, right? That's sort of like your demographic thing. So what year will Skeena die? Well, you, 19, so what's 1961 plus uh, 80? What do you get? Probably should, I probably should know this. This would be helpful to know. Um, what is it? Uh, 2041. What is that? 140, 2041. Okay. So anyway, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll do better, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm banking on. Any questions? So what are ways that are meaningful to try to estimate what uh, a missing value is in a data set? Okay. The one that seems like it maybe seem more nat most natural might be to take all the records that you have and take the uh, average and use the average value as what you impute for it. Okay, does everybody agree that's usually a, a pretty good prediction? Yeah. Okay. Any questions about it? What would we, would that what would have happened if we did that by um, what you call it? by, uh, you know, on my, my, what year somebody was going to die data. What would have happened if I did that for my Wikipedia? When am I going to die? If I took the average death year of every person in Wikipedia, what is the average death year of every person in Wikipedia? If you had to take a guess. 1880, something like that. 1880, maybe it's something like 1880s, something 1700, who knows? Yeah. But it would obviously be, in this case, the wrong thing to do. Does everybody kind of agree? It would show that the average person, you know, all the living people today would die before they were born. Okay? And that would add all kinds of strange things to the data, right? So mean value into imputation is kind of a generally a good idea. One of the nice properties is it leaves the average value uh, of the column the same. So if, we, if it was lifespan, lifespan, putting in the average lifespan makes sense. And now the average value here doesn't change. And it's probably not a bad prediction. Another idea for imputing that seems weird, but actually has some good properties, is what we would call random value imputation. What happens if you um, take your, uh, you know, you, 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 you see a missing value and you just simply randomly pick one of the values from the, uh, that, that is there in that field and use that as your estimate, okay? What's the good property if you select a value at random for each field? Well, one is that it, it, it actually, an expectation will leave the mean unchanged. So that's a good thing. But the other thing that's true is that every time you, you ran this, if you did this a second time, you would end up with different values here. One thing that's kind of good is if you repeatedly select random values and build a model and see how accurate it is, okay? If you keep doing this with, you know, a hundred times different, using different random imputation, you can see whether the imputation is doing anything to the model. If the imputation is doing something to the model, that's a bad thing. This gives you a, a way to figure out what is the uh, impact of that. Any questions about that? Another way, uh, which turns out to be kind of neat, okay? is um, sometimes when you have a data set and you have missing values, it pays to try to build a model to predict what the missing values are, okay? So suppose, let's say that in a particular column of your data set, maybe a third of the values are missing, okay? Um, 
then maybe what you might want to do is to build a linear regression model that tries to predict what the value of this field is given all the other fields in the data set, right? And, um, you know, uh, maybe by the way, this would have figured out what would be the best year for somebody to predict for somebody to be dead, dying, right? If I tried to predict birth, you know, the death year, and I had their birth year as one of the features. Maybe I would have learned that the best model was birth year plus average lifespan. Okay. So does everybody kind of see that 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 by using linear regression or some any so any other kind of modeling method, you can sometimes come up with a model to predict whether or not um, fields are missing, what the values are of missing items. Any questions? Or you use your, um, what you call your knowledge of what the data set is to get a sense as to what is a meaningful value for these things. In the, in the sales data that you're working on, are there any missing values that you guys have seen? No values, missing values. Is there any column that has had such a thing? Going once, yes. Uh, not, not so far as I've noticed. Not so far, okay. <laughs> um, if so, you are lucky, um, but uh, you know, but recognize that not all data sets have that property to it. Okay, any questions um, about uh, imputation? Uh, any questions about cleaning? I think this is where I'm gonna stop for now. Uh, just a thought, uh, when we were discussing the Wikipedia example for mean value imputation, instead of taking the mean of, let's say, the year they died, would it be, like, is it a good idea to take the mean of the age of everyone mentioned on Wikipedia and then predicting the... So that would be, the way I came up with 80 was I made a guess as to what the average lifespan was. In fact, the, 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 the right thing would be um, to figure out what the, implicitly, what the actual average lifespan is, okay? And that might be a, a data set thing. So taking the average of the difference between death year and um, birth year might give you an idea as to what the right amount to add on to that is. Although, what would, would there be a problem if we did that in Wikipedia? Why would mm -hmm. adding the average age, age in Wikipedia maybe not be the best model? Uh, like the, from the top of my head, it could create a problem Let's say for someone who's 60 years old, and if our average comes out to be 50 years, then according to our model, the person should already be dead. Okay, so, it, so, okay. so one possibility that you're saying is, you, you're saying that you happen to have data, uh, it's an interesting point. You have a knowledge that, um, that if somebody was dead, Wikipedia would know about it, okay? Yeah. And so you might want to say that the, uh, a better model than just adding 80 years would be what is today's date, take the greater of today's day year and 80 plus their birth year. That yeah. would be one, that would, I, I agree with you, that's a better model. Um, yeah. The other problem it has to do with people of different lifespans, okay? Back, um, you know, back 100 years ago, people did, you know, People didn't live to, um, you know, what you call it, to, you know, the, it's actually amazing how much life expectancy has changed during my life, okay? That, you know, I kind of thought, you know, grew up thinking 80 was, was very old and, uh, and, you know, you're very lucky if you make it there. You guys are likely to blow by 80, no problem, okay? Because life expectancy has grown. And so, um, that's why I think taking the average in Wikipedia might not be the right thing. Maybe the average of recently dead people would be a, a, a better model. Okay, but notice that to do that, you need to know something about the context of your data set.
and uh, you know, I don't want you to be afraid to use knowledge of the world to help you come up with better models rather than just thinking, oh my God, I gotta just do a program on a data. Okay, any questions? Any questions at all about imputation or data cleaning or anything like that? If not, good luck, get to work on the homework and, uh, uh, if, uh, and I will see you guys on Tuesday.